and let's go to section 5 the bird of wisdom subtitle hoots for social freedom h o o t s and with this verb you can understand what bird we are going to talk about hoots let's talk about owl in literature or in myth especially greek and roman myth owl is a bird of wisdom a symbol of knowledge why because it is associated with the roman goddesses minerva m i n e r v a and she has owls right and that's called the owl of minerva the owl of minerva is known for its wisdom because it belongs to the goddesses of wisdom minerva we can see this in literature for instance let's look at the victorian writer uh, tonkray william macpis tonkray and his famous work his masterpiece vanity fair in vanity fair we have two heroines one amelia sidley another becky sharp in the opening scene what happens both amelia sidley s e d l e y amelia sidley and becky sharp rebecca sharp they leave miss pinkerton's academy for young ladies right so this is kind of a parting scene and they are going to leave this academy and when they leave you know it's uh, one who runs that academy is uh, miss pinkerton she has this habit a kind of a tradition if someone leaves the academy she presents them with a book and the book is dr johnson's dictionary uh, 1755 uh, she signs that book and because she is a friend of dr johnson and she always gives a book to anyone who leaves this academy and miss pinkerton is very much uh, in awe of miss uh, amelia sidley she loves her so much but she hates the other character the major one in the novel becky sharp so she takes just a single just a dictionary she doesn't want to give another dictionary based a dictionary on becky sharp but miss pinkerton has a sister jemima uh, she is humble and she wants to present uh, her own copy of johnson's dictionary to becky sharp a poor girl an orphan whereas amelia sidley she is a bit rich so here is a description of miss pinkerton this is how the narrator describes her that pompous old minerva of a woman could not see from the difference of rank and age between her people and herself uh, you know she can't really understand amelia sidley and her good nature okay so that's the description and she actually stays in minerva house there is a house called minerva house in that academy uh, miss pinkerton's academy okay so now when we read this uh, description only you no know, if we are aware of this connotation or symbolism minerva is an owl which represents wisdom or also here a pompous one because she is a teacher right miss pinkerton if we are aware of that then we read something else we read more into this passage or else we'll just read and let it go old minerva of a woman that's all it's actually a metaphor right so it's a place of knowledge miss pinkerton's academy but it's not just about wisdom because amelia sidley is more wise she's wiser than uh, miss pinkerton and there is also the other side the other side is a it's also a flop because we have another character becky sharp the round character anyone remembers who called becky sharp a round character a person who wrote a work in which he talked about flat characters and round characters and a round character is one which evolves in a piece of literature all right and it goes on and on em foster's aspects of novels beautiful e, uh, yes em foster's aspects of the novel so in that work he introduced the terms the flat character and round character for flat character we have mrs macaber from dickens novel for round character he gives becky sharp as an example becky sharp from vanity fair 
And in the opening scene, Becky Short is hurt because she was hurt by Miss Pinkerton, but that's not the reason for her to hurt her sister, Jemima, because Jemima truly loves this girl and she gifts her a book, Johnson's Dictionary, but what she does is she throws back, you know, Johnson's Dictionary back into the garden and she goes away with her friend, Amelia Sidley to her house, Amelia Sidley's house. So that's the opening scene of this one. Then there are a lot of uh, love triangles and love problems. And finally, there is a change of heart in Becky Sharp. That's, uh, that's happened towards the end of the work. Okay. So if you're interested, please read the work. And now let's go to the war poet, Edward Thomas and his poem, The Owl. Here, owl is a different owl. It's an, yes, it's a bird of wisdom, but as we know, knowledge sometimes can trouble us. So here is a poem. It's about a soldier who is still alive, whereas uh, his fellow soldiers died in the war. He escaped, he survived. So he has this survivor guilt or survivor's guilt. And that troubles him. So World War I, the poem talks about World War I and its atrocities. So we have a nocturnal cry of the dead. Let's look at some of the lines. Then at the inn, I had food, fire, and rest, knowing how hungry, cold, and tired was I. All of the night was quiet, barred out, except an owl's cry, a most melancholy cry. So there is peace. Now the war is over. He has survived. He has come out of the field. He is staying in an inn. Uh, he is no longer hungry. Everything is satisfied, but still he hears the owl's cry because here the owl's cry represents the cry of the dead, which is melancholic. So shaken out long and clear upon the hill, no merry note, nor cause of merriment, but one telling me plain what I escaped and others could not. So that's what troubles him. You know, he feels guilty that I survived, whereas my brothers, uh, died in the war. Maybe this uh, soldier suffers from cell shock. Uh, people suffered that day. And that night as in I went. So throughout his life, he's going to hear this cry of the dead. So this is what happened to soldiers who survived uh, the World War I. And these are some of the World War I poets. We have Richard Aldington, Edmund Blunden, Rupert Brooke, then Wilfred Wilson Gibbon, Robert Graves, Wilfred Owen, a major poet, a famous one, then Isaac Rosenberg, then Siegfried Sassoon. Right? When Wilfred Owen met Sassoon you know, in a hospital, you now he was inspired to write poetry. Uh, and he, there are a lot of poems, but some of the best poems, and one among them is Mental Cases, you know. People can't understand why these soldiers went mad. And this poem is about them. Wilfred Owen's Mental Cases. Let's read a line, a few lines. Dawn breaks open and look at the simile since a war poet, a war poem. Dawn breaks open like a wound that bleeds afresh. Here is a guy who is mentally disturbed. Whenever he looks at dawn, he is reminded of the wound and the blood in the field. Thus, their heads wear this hilarious, hideous, awful falseness, falseness of set smiling corpses. In the sense, they are living dead. They are like zombies. They are dead. They are, they are actually corpses, but still they are alive. They gone mad. And they are they are always a kind of a set smile. They always laugh to themselves, and that's how. People look at them, mad people, okay? And if you want to read um, Wilfred Owen's another famous poem, Dulce a decorum est. It's a Latin phrase. Uh, in Latin phrase, it means sweet and fitting. What is sweet and fitting? To die for one's nation. So to die for one's nation, to sacrifice yourself for to save one's nation, that is sweet and fitting, a reward. 
and which was questioned by Wilfred Owen in that poem of the same name, Dulce a Decorum Est. And let's end this section with the owl. The owl, or the owl, is the name of the novel by the Tamil writer, Cho Dharman. And it's also translated in English, published by Oxford, Kugai. So in Tamil title, Kugai, and it's translated into the owl. But Kugai, you can't say owl. I mean, in the sense, Kugai is an old Tamil word. It has some uh, kind of um, history to it. Now it uh, assumes history. In a sense, it represents history, not assumes. It represents history. When we say Kugai, it's an old word in Sangam. It, it is used in Sangam literature, Tamil Sangam literature. So it has some history. Similar way, the, the novel is about Dalits and their struggle. And they have Owl as their god in this particular work. So here, Owl is not simply an Owl. It's a metaphor for the Dalits and their struggles. And it also tells their story. The Owl is more of a historian here. That's why I think maybe the writer has chosen this word, Kuhari, instead of the another ordinary word, Andai. That's an ordinary one. Both means Owl, but this had some history to it. So he might have chosen that this word for that reason. And also this Kugai is a witness to all the atrocities uh, done to the oppressed. So here the owl is more of a symbol of a hoot of the oppressed because it records their history, it records their suffering. And it also lets out a cry of resistance. They're not going to yield that easily. They are going to fight back. So very symbolic. I enjoyed reading this novel. It was translated uh, by Vasanta Surya. Uh, translation, initially I had some problem with the reading uh, this translation because it's not exactly in the sense, uh, uh, you know, typical English translation. Uh, the translator ha had done something different in the sense he tried to, um, uh, the translator tried to uh, capture the essence of Tamil syntax and other things and the locality and the essence that the language spoken there. So he has done something to do with the English language and this translation reads beautiful uh, or awkward, but it conveys the essence. So that's what uh, uh, the target of, that should be the target of the translator. And in that case, Vasanta Surya has done a good job. 